right, so I'm really excited to talk to this group. As I said earlier, I do a ton of these presentations uh, across the world, not for cancer typically, but sometimes cancer. And, uh, and that's been part of my business for the past 10 years. I'm now in tech, as Adele said, uh, but uh, for the past decade, I was a consultant at a company. And then previous to that, what everybody likes to talk about in my, my first chapter of life, uh, I was a fighter pilot. And so I'll kick off with that. We'll have some fun with this conversation. We'll talk a little bit of cancer, but we'll also talk a little bit about what I took away from it, uh, what translated from my world as a warrior in the fighter pilot community, and how quickly I found out that that meant nothing when I was up against cancer. I was much more uh, well suited to go after a MIG aircraft in the sky and uh, you know take down an enemy aircraft than I was to face a stage four cancer. Event and how little I was prepared for that. And on top of that, how much I admire every person in this room. We are talking about at our table earlier, Carol and I were talking about the fact that we see people in their best moments as they fight cancer. And certainly not every moment, you know, there are ups and downs, but I would argue you see people that are standing up to something that they never intended to, um, and they're, they're not standing up to it voluntarily, and so, uh, you know, we have to do it. But I, I hope you don't miss the fact that we're seeing one another, the people in this room, literally in their finest moments of life when they're standing up to something so challenging, whether you're a patient or you're a caregiver, I truly believe that that's the case. So we'll talk a little bit about the fighter plane. I feel anybody recognize this plane, by the way? Yeah. What is it? F-15. F-15, yeah, exactly right. F-15, so F-15, I flew for 15 years in the Air Force. I have more than 3,000 missions in F-15s, T-38s, which are training aircraft, and uh, it flew about 3,500 hours uh, during that time frame. Escorted the president all around the globe as part of Operation Noble Eagle following the attacks of 9-11. And I also was stationed on the coast um, following the attacks of 9-11. If you remember back that time period, we weren't sure that it wasn't going to happen again right away. And so we stationed all these alert airplanes all over the world, or the country at least. And we were ready to go intercept an airliner should it start to behave erratically. And so uh, I had lived in that world for 15 years. When this picture was taken, I was on top of my game, on top of my plane, everything was going fantastic. And then I got the news that a lot of people in this room got. And at, at this time, I was actually interviewing, I was down to the finals to join uh, the Thunderbirds, which are like the Navy Wings, right? Except the Thunderbirds are. Better, exactly. <laughs> so they're, they're better. Uh, so I just need to be in the finals for the Thunderbirds when this went down and uh, found out I had stage four cancer. My whole life came to a screeching halt and uh, I was dealing with that. And then the additional details I don't typically talk about because nobody would understand, I, you know, this room clearly does. I had mucinous adenocarcinoma. Uh, it had gone into my bladder, so extremely invasive into my bladder. My small intestine, my large intestine, of course, and then the lymph nodes all across my abdomen. That there were four active lymph nodes at that point. And that's the stage four, and then most of us get the stage four diagnosis uh, on this track. Uh, so anyway, here I am at the peak of good health, I thought, and then I got into this, this situation. Now I had some tells, meaning I had some symptoms, just like a lot of us did, that uh, that we missed along the way. Through no fault of our own, by the way. Nobody expected the appendix to be the culprit including our doctors in this journey, and we all have stories like that. Uh, but I was flying this plane, which are the same dimensions as a tennis court. And if you can picture me flying around in the sky with a tennis court going two times the speed of sound, that's about what it feels like to fly an F-15. And so at this point, and by the way, who here has seen the movie Top Gun? What about the new one? Most of the crew. Okay, awesome. We're going to talk some Top Gun uh, in this presentation. <laughs> I also do, in most of my presentations, I do the, uh, the two truths and a lie. You know what that is? You tell three things, two of which are true, and one of which is a lie. And you're going to have an advantage here because I'll say at one point in my life, and continuously because it never goes away, I've battled stage four cancer. And we all know, of course, that's the truth. And then I will say, I have weighed as much as 2,000 pounds in my life. That's the second one. And then the third one that I'll say is that uh, I've flown the F-22. Which one of those is a lot? Any guesses? <laughs> yeah. Who, why, how would I possibly weigh 2,000 pounds? Anybody know? Yeah, 
Gravity. Yeah, somebody watched Maverick this summer. <laughs> so G-Force is exactly right. So when I fly the plane, I would experience G-Forces on my body. And, and what that means is, if you've ever been on a roller coaster and you go upside down, you feel that sinking feeling, maybe you even feel like you're going to pass out a little bit and you know, get a little lightheaded. That's, uh, that's the common reaction because the blood is leaving your head. You weigh more. You know, so if I'm pulling two Gs, it's two times the force of gravity, and so my 200 pound body was about 400 pounds. And so you can do the math and you can figure out, gosh, you must have pulled a lot of Gs to get to 2,000 pounds. And I did, and I weighed a little bit more too at that point. So uh, it was nine Gs that got me to 2,000 pounds. So I know what it feels like to weigh 2,000 pounds. My arm weighed 400 pounds. My leg weighed 500 pounds. And they don't show you that in the movies, right? Top Gun doesn't really show you how hard it is to strain through that, those Gs. And I'm bringing this up because that was really my tell for cancer. So when you're pulling Gs, as I alluded to, the blood is leaving your head, it's trying to pull in your feet, and you're trying to push it back up as hard as you can. And so we would work out a ton, look like little bodybuilders in our, in our 20s because we had to, because we pass out on the plane. We were definitely afraid of passing out because it just was instant death that occurred. And so we would have to squeeze our muscles to push the blood back up into our brain. And, uh, and so the other thing we had was a G suit that we wore around our body that would inflate so that it would help us out a little bit. We figured it gave us like two G's worth of blood. So it would push, it would push against my legs, push against my abdomen, and it would push the blood back up in my head. Well, I would fly with a G suit every day, but all of a sudden I started noticing a little bit of pressure in, in this area right here. And not painful, like a, on a scale of one to 10, like a two, right? And I would kind of shift and try to move it around and then it would get into a place where I was comfortable again. But it was bad enough, and we got inspected enough by the doctors, because it was just so expensive to train us that they, they were always inspecting us, and each plane cost 50 million, so they, they had to make sure that we were safe to fly it. I would bring it up, and I would say, I, it's probably nothing, but I got this pain right here, and it's not going away, and that's why it kind of hurts when I pee, and uh, you know, I don't know what's going on, and they said, well, you've got an infection. You've got a muscle problem. You've got, you know, I'm sure we could all come up with a list of things you got, right, before we got there. And so I went through that for about a year of, of presenting, not on a daily basis, but for, for presenting enough that while I flew, that it became a concern for the doctors. And, uh, and then we did a scope, uh, which was one of my least favorite conversations ever because the doctor said to me, hey, we're going to do an extra test here and we're going to take a look and find out uh, how uh, you, you look inside, and uh, we're going to do what's called a scope, and look inside your bladder, to which I said, sounds great, is that like an ultrasound, or what are we talking about here? And I said, think again, we're not going to go in a different direction. <laughs> the fun train began for me, not before. And so, uh, and so everybody in this room can relate to all that, the things that occur after that took place. Before we do that, go into my meta battle, I'm going to share a little bit about the, the flying aspect of it and giving an idea what it felt like to be pulling those G's. So I'm gonna share a video of us flying in F-15s. Uh, this is of my friend pulling G's, it's not me. I'm in mean, some of the videos, but you, you can't see me in the cockpit. Uh, but you get a good idea of what, uh, what it's like. Yeah, it. Switches and dots in the cockpit. 
and this person is looking around the entire time. And as a reminder, this person weighs nine times more than they typically do. So their head, which weighs you know, 10, eight to 10 pounds of human head weighs, is their head weighs nine pounds. So in order to move it around like that, that's extremely painful and a lot of energy. And as soon as you open your neck like that, all your blood tries to leave your head. So you're, you're doing this at the expense of your G tolerance and staying conscious. Why is he looking around? What's he looking at? Yeah. His objective. I wanted somebody to bring that up because I think it's a great analogy for what I experienced with cancer. And we'll talk about that. I'm going to pull this out just so we don't all hear that, that buzz throughout the entire presentation. I'll put it back in later for the uh, video. There we go. Uh, there's a great quote that the dying have the most to teach us about life. Have you heard of that before? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Why is that, do you think? Why is it that a glimpse into our mortality teaches us something about life that we wish we would have known. Explain it. Yeah, it certainly shows us that the end is which is one of the big epiphanies from my cancer. They told me about 18 months when I first got it, I could expect to live, which I'm seeing head nods and it's probably a very common one. Uh, the, the big surprise for me, oddly enough, was not just that I was going to die in 18 months, but I was going to die, period, right? Because I, I was 33 at the time, I was a kid, and every, I was on top of my world, and of course I was doing a dangerous game as a fighter pilot, and I had lost some friends, but it wasn't still this, this you know, thing that this visceral challenge that I had in front of me that I had to face. And so all of a sudden, this notion of death, well, absolutely terrifying, and having me rock my deal, we'll talk about that too. But let's go back to this concept of how it, it gave, gives us the most to teach about life. Why else do we think that is? Yeah, we see the world differently, right? We, we have, I like to call it a clarity. Mm -hmm. I think all of a sudden, all the noise of the world, everything that happened the day before is gone, and all you have to focus on is what's most important in your life. And what should have been most important all along, right? And now we get this message loud and clear. If you're like me, the day before, I was watching the clock and mad that I had to be at work so long, and dealing with traffic and frustrated with things, then the second I got my diagnosis, all that disappeared. Like literally the moment, I, I mean, I did even to the point where I was mad at myself that I ever worried about those things, that I ever let my anxiety level go up on something so trivial in the past. Give us that clarity. And for me, that's like the pilot in the plane who's steering outside the cockpit. He's got 350 switches and dials in front of him, and yet he's focused on the most important thing. And to, to the strenuous nature of everything that he's doing in the cockpit to maintain sight of that. And that's what I thought about. It translated so well from my life as a fighter pilot to what I was now facing. All of a sudden, I realized that all these instruments and dials in my life were there as noise and distractions and things I should not have been paying attention to. And with great clarity, I got this glimpse into what should have been prioritized. And at this point, I typically share what my, what my uh, clarification points were and what my epiphanies were. But it's, it's a challenging thing to do with this crowd because I know you've all had that same glimpse and we all had different epiphanies in that moment. Maybe some of the same, but, but certainly you know, just as valid as epiphanies. And so before I share mine, I want to add that I really want to hear yours by the end of the night too. So whether you're comfortable doing that here or social hour at some point, I love, love, love to hear what each of us has got this glimpse into what's most important in life and what we took away from, from those hard times. Yeah, in a moment. In a moment, everything. And you never see the world the same. Yeah. Uh, but I'll, I'll argue it's hard to maintain this. And I'm 12 years out. I'll talk a little bit in a bit about how that's, that perspective is such a gift. But then as you go back to real life, things start to erode it. And it's, we're human and we just have to fight it every day. So, a little bit more of my background. So, this is a picture from uh, the big surgery that they had on me. By the way, I did not have uh, MOAS. They took out uh, most of my intestines, uh, some small intestines, um, part, a large part of my bladder, and then all the lymph nodes and stuff too. And then I was seeing Dr. Mansfield, I had called Dr. Sugarbaker, I had called Dr. Logie, is he in this room? No. Logie. Logie. So I called Dr. Logie, and by the way, doctors are phenomenal. I mean, truly, I have to say, like the, the I, I was nobody to them. I'm somebody who's just playing the fire pilot card and saying, hey, can you help fill out? And look at, I did, I, they're, they're not being paid to do it, I'm just sending my scans over to them. Every one of these doctors was extremely helpful and gave me awesome feedback. And not always the feedback I wanted. Dr. Logie actually was one of the ones that was, was least optimistic about my recovery. 
and which he was giving me his professional opinion. I, I'm, I'm sure he was very accurate in his assessments based on his experience. And um, so I don't have any emotion with that whatsoever, so I say thank you uh, for doing it. I talked to Dr. Sugarbaker, and he said, let's operate right now. And uh, I was excited about going down that path because I just wanted to be in the fight. And then I talked to Dr. Mansfield, and he said, let's take a little bit of a measured approach on this. And he gave me the quality of life versus quantity of life speech. I think he's rehearsed it many times because it sounded so <laughs> awesome when I heard it. Like I, I, I felt super at ease as he's telling me this story, and I'm sure it wasn't his first time telling it, but he's great if you haven't ever met him. And, and, so, and so we decided to do the wait and see approach. The other thing I'll mention, I don't typically share this with everybody, it's in my book, but it's, it's a little more personal. I don't put my kids' situations out there uh, as, you know, as often. And that's that my three-year-old son had a tumor in his lung at the exact same time. So literally, within three weeks, we find out that my kiddo, and he's totally fine, uh, he had most of his lung removed on the left side, and he, I literally was texting with my wife uh, uh, 30 minutes ago, and I watched a video of him winning and swimming. Uh, and I, so important we never talk about him. I wouldn't talk, I would never do this presentation in front of him, for example. And the reason is this, I don't ever want him to think that he's handicapped or to think that he has less um, to do out in that, that, in that pool or on that field or wherever else he is. I, I, you know, everybody has their genetic pluses and minuses. I don't want him ever to think that that's something that can hold him back. And it's just proof that hard work can get most of us to the place we want to be anyway. And it's just such a, it's just a great testimony. All right, so he had his lung removed, most of his lung removed, and so we're just going through this nightmare of nightmares at this point and dealing with um, all this. And I should mention my wife, who's an absolute saint, who should have come out here because I'd love to introduce her to you as well. She needs to write the next book, just like you caregivers need to write a book as well. And, and, and I think that's a much more difficult job. And yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, I, I, I could be as beat up and sad and, and emotional as I needed to, and I, exact, I was that every day. And my wife had to put on a brave face. And I, and I told her, I can't believe you never cried when that happened. And she said, you never cried. I was crying constantly. <laughs> <laughs> never in front of you. Exactly. But never in front of you. Yeah. And I mean, if you gosh, maybe you choked up and think about it now, how, how brave she was and how much she stepped up in that moment. So let's go back to the story. So that clarity, that glimpse into what's most important. And for me, as I took stock of my life, and I was thinking, this might be like my legacy at this point, like up to 33 years old. Uh, and that's it. Am I happy about it? What am I happy about? What am I not so happy about as I look at it? And what I was surprised by were a couple things. One, I wasn't, I thought I'd be really happy about the times when I won, when I, when I had the trophy on the wall. That sure was important to me when I was not sick. Right, but me, I better get that promotion, I better get that top of the you know, fighter pilot challenge. Right? Whatever was in front of me, I better get the trophy for it. And now I could care less about that. Like literally my wall of fame in my house mattered nothing to me. It, it almost looked like it was just idolatry. It was just ego driven, just purely trying to build up me, and that's it. And it's there's nothing I don't want to indict that because I think that's a very natural way to be, but all of a sudden when I had that glimpse, I realized that was a bit of a waste of my time. So there were things I was happy with. And those things I was happy with all came back to two, the two times. The times when I was surrounded by an elite team and the times when I was on an inspiring mission. And so as I look back at my life, whether that was at the Air Force Academy, where I was surrounded by people that were better than me every step of the way. Like they're smarter than me, they're valedictorians, they're all uh, the captain of the football team. And every, we did this exercise when you get to the Air Force Academy and they say, stand up, if you're a valedictorian, and people probably stand up, and there's like seven of you, and then say, stand up if you are a coach or captain of a football team or your, your high school team. And, and by the end of like five accolades that everybody would think would be the most important things at the previous high school, the whole room is standing, to which the leader said, you're not special, sit down. And just, <laughs> you know, just from, from my place. And the reason I bring that up is because I was surrounded by people that were better than me, and I loved it. I had to earn my spot every day and try to make, um, try to make a difference on that team. And we were on an inspiring mission. We were serving something that was bigger than us. Uh, and I, I choose those opportunities wherever I can, whether it's with my family and the elite team that I'm with there, and the inspiring mission my wife and I have, and created new human beings and, and setting them up for life, or it's 
at uh, the consulting company that I led, uh, at Afterburner for 10 years, and now at VMware in my role. I never would take a job that did not inspire me, and you know, I would challenge all of us and to, to not do that as well. The best work feels like focused play, just like when we were kids. The things that we enjoyed the most, not the fire pilot, it was the best when it was focused play. And, and I, you can find that in other places. I gladly left being a fire pilot, and I'll tell you about that in a moment, because I knew that it had stopped becoming focus play and it became something that was ego driven and wrote and I wasn't growing anymore. All right, so that was the first thing I took away from it that it was elite teams and inspiring missions that were the most important to me. And it, when I look back at my regrets, I was surprised about that too because I had certainly failed a bunch up to that point. But my regrets were not those times when I failed. My regrets were, what? What do you think they were? You're, you're just as close to this as I am. What are the regrets in life? You didn't try. Yes, the things we didn't do. I wish that, I mean, that's, people remember nothing else from the glimpse that all of us get at get this time. It's not your failures you regret. No one's keeping track of your failures. They could care less in our own heads. We're the star of a movie, and that's what we're paying attention to. We could care less about counting the wins and the losses of the people around us. And so we act like the world is watching us, and they're not. And I could have cared less about my failures at that point. I was only upset about those times when I didn't win. And the reason is because I had held back. I'm really trying hard, because I didn't want you to see me fail. I was already a fighter pilot. I, I already had this big ego-driven job. I signed autographs at NFL games and did flybys and, and all the things that at face value looked like they were important, but in this moment meant nothing. And when I was being really honest, for about five years, this had just been a place in my comfort zone, and I could do this with my eyes closed. And it was, and I love the mission, don't, don't get me wrong, it was an important mission, but it was no longer a growth period for me. And it was just me feeding my ego and not feeding mastery and change and development like I would want. And I remember thinking, I liked being a fighter pilot, but that wasn't supposed to be the book of my life, it was supposed to be a chapter. It was supposed to be a moment, and I made a commitment to myself that if I ever had a chance, I would make another chapter out of my life and go after something else along the way and do the thing that nobody does in 15 years as a fighter pilot when you're five years away from retirement, and that's leave, and to go start in a business world where I knew absolutely nothing, and I was terrified. I didn't understand for those in business, like sales pipeline meant nothing to me, um, net income versus profit versus revenue, all those terms meant literally nothing to me. I, I could tell you everything about a missile, but I had no idea. I, I was you know, no better than a 19-year-old starting college in, in the business world, and I had to catch up. And so there's three huge takeaways from that cancer experience. I call them my three Gs. I'll go through each one. The first G is growth. Growth, for me, is one of the few things that made me happy in life. As I look back at my life, those periods where I was growing is when I was happy. And what does it take to grow? Every time we grow, how are things going for us? Yeah, they're, we're uncomfortable, right? Growth does not occur unless we are in discomfort. And so I look back at my life, and the moments where I was uncomfortable, you know, I, I didn't like it at the time, of course, clearly, but that was the time when I was really enjoying, you know, expanding my boundaries, reaching what I was capable of, and then figuring out how to go past that in whatever I was doing in life. And I realized that for a long time, I was no longer growing as a fighter pilot. It had just become really easy. So this picture, that's actually me, and I'm flying upside down at 50,000 feet above the ground, and now it's simple. I was like driving to work to, work, to the point where you can turn off your brain and, and you can just do it. The best example, and the reason I decided to stop being a fighter pilot after I started getting better um, and they let me start flying again was when I was flying in this position called close trail, which is about 10 feet away from another airplane, just below their jet wash. If you watch Top Gun, you know, stay out of the jet wash, you're in a flat spin. That's kind of true, uh, but you, you don't want to go in it. And so I'm just below the jet wash and I'm following lead through the sky as lead does a barrel roll. So we're going to go upside down, going like 600 miles an hour, 10 feet away from that other plane as they continue this. So when we're in this position, and I'm upside down, I look up, I just glance up for a second, and up is down, because I'm upside down, and I see the ground, and I see the road that I've got to take to get home that night. You know what I'm going to say? <coughs> There's a bad traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, ah, oh, I'm going to be so late, and I have plans to go out, and now I've got to call Marsha when I get down, and 
what, what if there's another way I can get home? And am I just still going through this litany of things in my head about what I'm going to do so I don't end up in this traffic jam because I'm going to be 45 minutes late home at this point in time. And as I'm going through this maneuver, it dawns on me that if I'm worried about traffic as I'm upside down going 500 miles an hour, 10 feet behind another plane, then I'm firmly established in my comfort zone. And I'm doing exactly what I said I didn't want to do when I got into an opportunity to, to uh, get into remission. And so I had to challenge myself and get outside of that comfort zone, which is exactly what I did. And what does that mean? Getting outside your comfort zone, not only is it uncomfortable, but it's also scary. Every single time it's scary. Our best lives are always on the other side of our fear. And I firmly believe that, and I try to live in a way that I take something out of that I'm scared of every day. And it's a long list of things I'm scared of, to include, at one point in my life, public speaking. At one point in my life, I used to sit behind, we, I did public speaking and huge auditoriums, but it didn't matter if it was 10,000 people or 300, it was still terrifying to me. And I would sit back there and feel myself completely start sweating and I would feel like I was gonna pass out and then there's hot lights. And I had to talk for 45 minutes to like I'm doing right now to an hour and I would be terrified of doing it. <clears throat> but I also remind myself that this is what I signed up for, this discomfort, even though I hated it in that second, is what I was volunteering to experience because I made a promise that that's what was on my path to growth in the past and I wasn't gonna make that mistake again and, and stay in my comfort zone. And so today, now I give a speech like this or on TV or anything and my pulse doesn't go 10 beats ever, there's tons of things I'm still scared of, there's tons of things I'm still bad at, but the point is I get to choose what I engage with and when I take on those fears and that's something that all of us can take away from that moment. That growth opportunity comfort zone is our enemy. Another thing that I did to get outside of my comfort zone uh, on the five-year anniversary of getting cancer, and Dr. Mansfield told me, you know, every quarter I'd go visit him and he'd say, uh, you don't have cancer this time, but probably coming um, pretty soon, you know. And he's just being realistic, it's a professional opinion, and uh, it's it was based off of a lot of statistics and experience. And, and so, and, and I'm glad he said that. I would, would have hated to get the bad news and not have expected it. And so we would wait though. So I'd live my life in little quarterly increments uh, for a couple of years. And it go, you understand. And then finally we got to the point where it looked like I could lift, lift my head up to the horizon a little bit more and see what else was coming. And I said, I'm going to reach five years. And this was the time when they gave me a really low expectation to see this date. I got to do something to celebrate it. And I got to do something that's consistent with my new plan of being uncomfortable. And so I said, I'm going to go try to do an Ironman triathlon. And my brain answered, you're stupid, uh, you've never done a marathon before, you've never done a triathlon before, your last bike said Huffy on it, uh, you, you're a pretty terrible swimmer, if you were being honest, I think you've done like two laps, and I, I said, I'm going to still try it. And so I got into a training program, and it was horrible, and you know, the training was difficult, but on a scale of horrible, what do you think was worse in my life that I had experienced up until this point? What a, you know, it's, it's, it's not, there's a silver lining to everything. Every single one of us has a new definition of what we can endure. And I'm here to tell you, an Iron Man does not really rank that high on all of our experiences at that point. But it's high enough that I won't do it again. <laughs> so I did the Iron Man Triathlon, went down to New Zealand, had an incredible time with that, uh, finished it, and then uh, said I'll never do it again, but I did want to keep finding other opportunities to get outside. Of By the way, any Iron Man athletes in the room, men or women? Nope. Um, the, uh, it's, 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 yeah, there's other things to do. Uh, <laughs> and then I got a chance to go be on the show American Ninja Warrior, and this is one of my favorite stories to tell because I failed miserably on the national TV show. You can't blink and, and see me on this. I mean, literally, like, I've run it, I didn't fall on the first one, but it might as well have been because it was, if you ever see the show, it's a series of obstacles where you gotta get up the warp wall. I don't think I got within 100 feet of that warp wall. You know, it was, I was in the second, uh, obstacle and fell off. But old me would have cared deeply about that and worried that you saw it and that you were judging me because, because of, nobody remembers, nobody remembers your victories or your failures. And so it gave me the opportunity to fail in a spectacular way on national TV. <laughs> <laughs> but I did it again. I've done it three times now and it gets better each time. And this last time, this last spring, I finished uh, pretty high in the top 10% of the group and almost got to the, uh, the work wall, which is the very end of the thing. So I had a lot of fun with it. So what is the point of all that? That's, you know, for many of us, these, you're not going to go do an Ironman triathlon, maybe you're maybe doing the American Ninja Warrior is not in your future. But these experiences pale in comparison to the triumph I felt and the discomfort that I had to overcome 
when I just did my first lap around the block following cancer. That was where the real victory occurred. And then every one of us can understand that, whether it's around your block or even just around your kitchen table as you're recovering from this and you are wildly outside of your comfort zone. And that's something to really celebrate. These are fun photos to share and they're dramatic and, and to other crowds they mean something, but I can share with you because you understand that these were at the very tail end of, of achievements. The, the very first ones were the most important ones. And those are the ones we all have experienced. So we have an opportunity to grow. Number one, G, growth, get outside your comfort zone, find something that scares you every single day and take it on and realize that our best lives are always on the other side of that fear. The next G is what? What do you think the next G is? This is a pretty obvious one. <laughs> What's the most common? If I was gonna be like a Hallmark card, what would I, what would I see? You, if you wanna... Gratitude. That's, that's the third one. All right, you have the third one. If the goodness is a good one too, it's actually giving. So we, you know, give back effectively. Like, oh, of course, you give back, right? Why, why do I include that one? Because that was like a superpower when I was sick. All of a sudden, when I was a shadow of my former self, and my hair had turned silver and was falling out, and I weighed like 40 pounds less, and it you know, just didn't have a good future uh, in store for me, it was one of the greatest gifts during that time was I was able to go support this program where we help the at-risk youth in uh, San Antonio. San Antonio has an invisible graduation rate. That's where I was stationed at the time. It's only 35% graduation, and uh, it's just the worst in the country. And a lot of migrant kids are there and they just have no chance and they just need somebody to show them the path because they just haven't had that conversation about what could be next after high school. And we had this opportunity through this program to reach out to these kiddos and they, they grabbed this lifeline with both arms and they were so appreciative and they did amazing things and I followed these kids for years. And the point of me telling you this is because in the midst of my cancer battle, this was taking place and I go to, go to have these conversations and it was the strangest thing. And I bet some of you have experienced it. While I was helping out these kids, I would forget I had cancer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? You have that moment where you're no longer in this battle. And you're giving something to somebody else. And it's hard to feel sorry for yourself when you're helping out somebody else along the way. So it's a very selfish thing to give. I personally think, I mean, if, of course, other ancillary things take place, and it's fantastic. But it's a selfish act, ultimately, because you're getting so much in return. It was a superpower to help other people out. And there's a great quote that we're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. You've heard that quote, right? I always try to find two groups. One group where I'm pulling down the average, right? <laughs> I'm the one who's on the bottom. And somewhere argue that's not too hard for me to do. But I find that group and I am and find mentors, I find people that I want to become, and I, you know, just I, I learn from them and, and find a path. But I also find another group of five where I'm the one that has something to give to that group. And we can all find a group like that. When I talk to 19-year-olds about this, their common response is, well, I haven't experienced enough yet. And I say, You're, you've experienced more than a 16-year-old. You know, you know, you've done more than other kids. And you ask every single person has something to teach somebody else. And that giving is so powerful when we're able to do it. And it reminds us, we're just climbing up the ladder. We're just going after growth. That's a painful feeling. Who wants to just be uncomfortable their entire lives? And, Keep going for that, you know, that next Iron Man, that next American Ninja Warrior, or even that next lap around the block. At some point, you have to look back and see how far you've come. And the only way we can really do that is by helping others out and realizing, gosh, you really have come a long way. When you talk to somebody else who has cancer, and you realize that you're telling them how to be strong, and it reminds you that you are strong, and that you're taking this on in a, in a special way. But it took you helping somebody to really realize how far you've come. It's a good reminder that we don't have to do any of those things. So when I put up the stuff about growth and the things I've taken on in life and the discomforts I've experienced, I tell people all the time, that should not put pressure on you. When you think about the things that you can do and they're outside of your, your comfort zone and the fears that you might face, you don't have to do any of those things. You're enough right now. I was enough before I did any of the stuff that I showed pictures of. But there's a really important word change that I learned through cancer. I'm sure. Yeah, you can all relate. You don't have to do any of those things, but you do get to. And there was a time when all of us in this room, most of us that were patients, thought there were a lot of things we wouldn't get to do ever again. That one word change changes everything in life. When you don't have to do things, but you get to, you have the opportunity to, because we all know 
Many of us didn't get to do much more in our lives than we get to do things today. And we have that luxury. And what a great luxury it is. Giving. The third G, we said was what? Gratitude. Gratitude. Yes. And it's, once again, kind of hallmarky. If you were to pick the three G's, you're probably going to come up with the giving and gratitude ones. And those are predictable. It, this is just such a superpower in life. That's certainly what I've found. And, and there's a great quote by Teddy Roosevelt that comparison is the thief of all joy. Have you heard that before? Yeah. And we, it's, it's such a great, I wish society would pay more attention to that because we live like the literal kings and queens of 125 years ago. We literally, every single one of us, you know, even, even in the poorer communities, and I don't want to be dismissive about the challenges they face, that we still need to help out <coughs> the communities, but even in the poorer communities, we still live like the literal kings and queens of 125 years ago. The kings and queens who had access to food all across the world and then go find that in a supermarket. The kings and queens who would have you know, dreamed to fly somewhere and then have access to different parts of the, the world. And the medicine and antibiotic that makes you not die of a, an infection that killed people you know, 50 years ago. The, all of these things, kings and queens didn't have access to. The, the level of living that we have is so high. And yet, are we the happiest generation on earth? No, I'm not even close. I'd argue we're one of the least happy. And I think part of it is because we've been given so much that we feel this tension that we can't reconcile that I have this life. And we notionally kind of know how good it is, but at the same time, our happiness hasn't gone up. And so it depresses us and it makes us upset. Comparison is the thief of all joy. And if that's the case, then gratitude is the source. Gratitude is our opportunity to create joy. Not happiness. Happiness is a reaction to an experience. Joy is a decision that we make, and gratitude is one of those ways to make a decision. I learned how powerful it was because gratitude literally turned around the worst day in my entire life. Because again, when I tell the story to others, they don't relate. I'm sure many of you relate to this one. So the worst day in my entire life was in March of 2010. It was about six weeks after my initial diagnosis, and you can imagine the path that that went down. Uh, we don't know what's going on. We're sure it's not cancer. You're in good shape. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Two, it could be cancer, but yeah, probably something that, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And I mean, it, it's still the C word, and you, know, it's, you should be concerned about it, and we're going to take care of it, but it's something we'll take care of. But then all of a sudden, it's got something we've never seen before. Literally, when I got opened up and looked at me, the doctor was like, I have no idea. I'm going to show you pictures. Like, we're looking at this together. Like, can you believe us? <laughs> and, and then to the point now where it's stage four, and I'm doing the Google um, Doc stuff, and I'm seeing you know, what's, what happens to the store for me. And it's just terrific. So I'm going down this path, and one of the things I really was trying to do is find a doctor who knew what to, how to take care of this. And we all need to do it. If you go to the Facebook forums, what's the first thing anybody ever tells you? Go see a specialist. See somebody who knows what they're doing. You know, you see, literally, we just need to have that in our announcements and our, and our group. If you're showing up, here's a list of specialists. Don't talk to anybody else, because this is, this is going to be your best chance. And, and so I was going to see Dr. Mansfield, and I was driving to go see him at this point on this particular day. And I'll never forget. As we're driving there, I had this feeling of dread as we're going there. And I shouldn't have it because I've already had cancer for six weeks and I'm kind of getting used to this, this notion. You know, it's, still, it's still horrible, but I, I'm in a place now where it's not like today was worse. And so I don't, I, you know, there's not a real good reason I should have dread as I'm getting closer and closer and closer to the hospital. Uh, this dread just keeps getting heavier. Have your camera. I can't put my finger on it. I should be excited about this. I had a fight to get Dr. Mansfield. The military didn't want to pay for this, and we finally got to a place uh, where we could. And so I'm getting what I needed, the specialist, and my best chance at life. And we pull up to the hospital, my wife drops me off, and I walk up there by myself toward the hospital. If you ever been to MD Anderson, there's tons of people going in and out of it at all times, and uh, it just goes up into the sky, into Houston. It's just a big, huge building in downtown Houston. looks nothing different from any other huge building in the city. As I'm walking up to this building and this sense of dread is on me, I look up all these windows straight up into the sky and I realize why I'm so uncomfortable. Why I have this feeling of dread is because this is the building I'm going to die. And I'm walking into it. I don't know when, but it's going to happen. I'm going to be looking out of one of these windows and that's going to be it. 
And I remember I closed my eyes and I had tears streaming down my face. And I said, God, this isn't fair. <laughs> I said, I'm 33 years old. I don't deserve this. I've done what I'm supposed to do in life. I didn't take chances. I didn't do drugs. I didn't make bad decisions. I should not be dealing with this right now. You need to take this away from me. You need to heal me right now. <laughs> I'm so angry. And I opened up my eyes. And the tears were still streaming down my face. And the minute I did, I locked eyes with another person. And she was staring directly at me. I'll never forget. Beautiful blue eyes. Just gorgeous. She was looking right at me. And she had a bald head. She's got a mask on. And she's really thin. And she looks like she's about eight or nine years old. And her dad is pushing her into the hospital in a wheelchair. And she's staring at me. And we're locked eyes. She's looking at me, probably at this weird old guy crying on the side of the, this building. But we have this moment together. And in her eyes, I can see, see that she's afraid. And in that second, every ounce of self-pity <laughs> was gone. In that second, like a light switch. I went from the lowest low I've ever experienced in my life to now saying, God, I'm the luckiest person in the world. I'm 33 years old. I have two gorgeous kids. I have a beautiful wife. I get to be a fighter pilot. I live the most amazing life ever. Don't heal me, heal yeah. her. Right. And the door shut behind her and I was just left transformed in that moment. And I just sat there trying to make something of this, this time when I went from the, the, my eyes closed and the, just every ounce of self-pity you can imagine just the weight of the world on me and just feeling so sorry for myself to then saying I'm the most blessed, grateful person ever for the life I have, including the fact that I have cancer right now. I wasn't dismissive of the battle that I still had in front of me. And I made a vow as I was sitting outside the hospital that I was never going to feel sorry for myself again. And that no matter what was in front of me, it didn't change my, my diagnosis. I probably still had a massive battle and without a good ending at the end of it. I was, I was going to choose to be grateful and choose gratitude. And I never forgot that lesson. And I like to say that God absolutely healed me in that moment. One of the few times when I got my prayer answered right away. It wasn't answered in the way I wanted. <laughs> I still had cancer. But it wasn't the way I needed. I needed to be healed and to, be, to take this sense of self-pity away from me so I could experience my life differently. Growth giving gratitude. So as we wrap up, I've told that story countless times about that little girl. I've thought about that little girl for years and years. I wonder what happened to her. I wanted to meet her. I wanted to figure out who she was. And of course, I knew that Chances are very, very slim that would ever take place. And she was just such a transformative thing in my life. And I put her in the book, it was, you know, the book that I wrote was, that was one of the most important parts of it for me. And as I was promoting my book and telling others about my message on LinkedIn of all places, I posted that story that I just told you, that, that experience I had. And this gentleman wrote me back, Chad Barrett. And he said, Joel, in March of 2010, I was wheeling my little girl in the hospital. That's joking. Uh, and you know, she taught. She said she sounds like she taught you how to live, and she did that for us as well. Before she taught us how to die. Turned out that was a little girl. We figured it out uh, through through uh, some conversations and, and through some some date. Date matching. If you've ever been to MD Anderson, it's not a, there's, not, there's no kids there. Like, there's, no, there's a kid's version of it, but the one that we're going into for our treatment, I've seen like two kids there that are with their parents typically, certainly not being pushed in in a wheelchair. So, this is the person I saw. I've seen some pictures and I know it's her. So, I bring that part of the story up to say that that's why it's so important to have this tribe and this community and share these stories because we're all going through these challenges and we need to do it together. And I reached out to this father and, and deeply connected with him. And, it, and that was after I'd already written Survivor's Obligation, but we started a movement called Live the Obligation, which is about how all of us 
carry obligations will live differently <laughs> because of that. The, uh, the book, which I didn't talk about, Survivor's Obligation, the name comes from the, the sense of survivor's remorse that some of us could have, right? We're all survivors in this room, clearly. There's others that weren't. And I saw that in war, and I saw that in cancer, and, and I saw that some of the most positive, hardest fighting people that I knew with cancer didn't get the outcome that I got. And it's very easy to fall into a sense of guilt or, or remorse over that. But I didn't have that. I really didn't. I was never depressed over it. I was just so elated that I got this second chance. But I was transformed, not with survivor's guilt or remorse, but through a sense of obligation. An obligation that as I'm living the second chance that they didn't get, that I'd make an effort every day to earn that and to live differently because of it, knowing that they would have given anything to have the day that I was afforded. So anytime where I don't feel like doing what scares me or you know, stepping out from behind that stage and doing the presentation and, and the butterflies are there, I remind myself that it's my obligation to take those things on. I met a lot of really interesting people. There's one guy, he's in his 30s or 40s, and he was um, an American fighter pilot. And he also had stage four cancer, and I got speaking to him. And he said that, you know, a lot of people that go through such terrible things have something called survivor's remorse. You kind of get guilty that, why did I survive? What's so special about me? But he said he wasn't going to live his life being guilty. Instead, he was going to live his life through something called survivor's obligation. He now has an obligation as a survivor to the other people that didn't survive to basically live your life to the fullest and make the most of it. And that really stuck with me. Let's go. You're killing it. got off the plane, we're here in London. We flew on the red eye, super excited to be here. Very first thing that we did was to go see our friend Jack. And I'm now still fighting. I still have an obligation to myself, to my friends, to my family. The fact that you need to make the most out of your day and just your time on this planet. I'm about to swim the English Channel. Unbelievable swim! Thank you everybody, thank you all so, so much! We did it! Where did that come from? I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, okay. I love the idea of working so hard that you don't think you can you can go another inch, but you push yourself five more inches. You don't think you can go another step, but you push yourself ten more steps. Well, this is him completing a lap around the pool at three years old, only four months after surgery to remove yeah. most of his lung. I completed an Ironman triathlon on the five-year anniversary of beating cancer without ever having done a marathon, triathlon, or endurance event of any type. Yeah, yeah! On our way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. But you are a survivor too. If you're watching this, you've survived. That's not my story, that's our story as survivors. And it's
is so incredible to be with this group and see how you're living your lives now and how the caregivers are living their lives. And the loved ones that we've lost, we're living for them because we all carry that obligation. And it's not even just about cancer. We're all dying, right? Every one of us is dying at some point. It's the glimpse that we have, the clarity that we got, and then the accountability, the obligation to be different because we got that glimpse. Looking forward to spending some time with you, learning more about you tonight. Thanks so much.